Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2023. Welcome to lesson number three, ready for teaching on April 15. The author is Pastor Mark Finley, and your reader is Dr. Percy Harold. This lesson is from the series Three Cosmic Messages and is titled The Everlasting Gospel. Sabbath afternoon, April 8. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Your word is so precious to us, and as we look at the last book of the Bible this quarter, particularly this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. May we see Jesus, may we see your love and your grace for us. As the writer has written, uh, this book is just filled with grace, as are the three angels' messages. And as we open your word, we just pray that our lives may be in tune with your wishes for us and that we know that we can put our trust in you. Lord, today I'd like to pray particularly for those who are listening in Pai Alba and Monto in Queensland, for those in Kurrenbong, New South Wales, for those who listen from Guyana, such as Bruce Bruce Matthew and Evangeline and Jay Wynne, who listens, I'm not sure where, but Jay Wynn puts lovely comments on the YouTube version. Michael Chong and Jennifer Morgan and Debbie from Glendale Church in uh, the United States and Josephine Bailey and Claudio from Eureka in Texas and Sean Shields and Dawn Malcolm. Lord, each of us has our own needs and you know our needs, but today I'd like to pray for each of these people particularly and that you will bless them. But bless each of us as we open your word this week. May we know that this week we've spent with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Let's read that again. Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. In ancient Israel, when the heathen around them were polytheists, worshipping multiple gods of wood and stone, Israel's clear, identifiable, powerful statement of faith was found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Throughout the centuries, the chanting of the Shema, the name of the prayer based on the Hebrew word for here, reminded the Jews of the spiritual vision that united them as a people and that strengthened their resolve to maintain their unique identity as worshippers of the one true God. Let's read Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. For Seventh-day Adventists, the three angels' messages in Revelation 14 are our Shema. They are our identifying statement of faith. They define who we are as a people and describe our mission to the world. In short, our unique prophetic identity is outlined in Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. It is here that we find our passion to proclaim the gospel to the world. In this week's lesson, we will begin a detailed study of Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12, but we will do so through the eyes of grace as we listen to God speaking to our hearts. Sunday, April 9. A Grace-Filled Book of Hope When most people think about the Bible's last book, Revelation, they do not think about God's grace. When they consider God's last day message, their thoughts often turn immediately to frightening beasts, mystic symbols and strange images. 
the book of Revelation scares as many people as it reassures, which is unfortunate because it is indeed saturated with grace and filled with hope. That is, even amid the scary beasts and warnings of persecution and the hard times ahead, God still gives us reasons to rejoice in his salvation. Read Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 and chapter 14 verse 6. How do these verses together tell us about not just the book of Revelation, but about the everlasting gospel as well? Revelation 1, beginning at verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And Revelation 14 and verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Revelation is all about Jesus. It is his message to his people and is especially applicable to his church in the last days. It is the grace-filled message of our end-time hope. Throughout the book, Christ is described as the slain lamb and a blessing is promised to those who read, understand and act on the truths revealed. According to Revelation 1 verses 5 and 6, Jesus is the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. In Christ we are forgiven. Grace pardons our past, empowers our present and provides hope for our future. That is, in Christ we are delivered from sin's penalty and power and one day soon we will be delivered from sin's presence. This is the message of the Bible's last book, Revelation. And it also is an urgent message, first pictured as an angel flying swiftly in mid-heaven, having the everlasting gospel. The gospel? Salvation by faith in Christ? Christ's atoning death for us? The promise of eternal life, not because of what we can do, but because of what Christ has done for us? All this is at the beginning of the three angels' messages. Exactly. No wonder, then, that they are grace-filled messages full of hope and promise for us as broken and suffering beings. Though it's easy to focus on the beasts and warnings of the last days, as depicted in Revelation, how can we learn to balance all these out with what is undeniably the most important message of Revelation, Christ's self-sacrificing death in our behalf? Monday, April 10, The Everlasting Gospel Notice what Revelation 14.6, the beginning of the three angels' messages, starts with, the eternal or everlasting gospel. If we fail to understand the depth of the gospel, we will miss the entire point of the three angels' messages. We can never fully understand the issues in God's Judgment Hour message or the fall of Babylon or the mark of the beast if we fail to understand the gospel. Read 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Romans 3, 24-26 and Romans 5, verses 6-8. How is the everlasting gospel presented in these texts? What great hope is presented here for us. First of all, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. 
For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And Romans 3, beginning at verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And Romans 5, beginning at verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The gospel is the incredible good news of Christ's death for our sins, his glorious resurrection, and his ever-present love and concern for us. By faith in his shed blood and his resurrection power, we are delivered from both sin's penalty and power. Christ absorbed the Apostle Paul's thoughts and was at the centre of his teaching and preaching. The crucified Christ redeemed him from the condemnation and guilt of his past. The resurrected Christ gave him power for the present and the returning Christ gave him hope for the future. Notice four points in these passages in Romans. 1. We are justified freely by grace. 2. Grace is a declaration of God's righteousness. 3. Grace justifies those who by faith accept Jesus. 4. God's love was demonstrated for us while we were yet sinners. Christ's grace is unmerited, undeserved and unearned. Jesus died the agonising, painful death that lost sinners will die. He experienced the fullness of the Father's wrath or judgment against sin. He was rejected so that we could be accepted. He died the death that was ours so we could live the life that was his. Any wonder, then, that salvation must be by faith and without the deeds of the law? What could we possibly add? What could our works, even the best-intentioned, Holy Spirit-filled works, add to what Christ had done for us at the cross? And this plan, the plan of salvation, has been put in place even before the beginning of time. As we read in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. And Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love which helps explain why it is called the everlasting gospel. Before the world was created, God knew what would happen, and so he instituted the plan of salvation to meet the crisis when it eventually would come. Tuesday, April 11, A Story of Grace the three angels' messages are a story of grace. They are the story of a Saviour's love beyond measure, a story of Jesus who loves us so much that he would rather experience hell itself than have one of us lost. They are the story of a boundless, unfathomable, incomprehensible, undying, unending, infinite love. God is never caught by surprise. He is not subject to the changing winds of humanity's choices. As we have already seen, his plan to deliver us from the domain of sin was not some afterthought when sin reared its ugly head. 
God was not caught off guard by the awful drama of sin. Read Revelation 13 verse 8 and 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 to 20. What do these verses teach us about the plan of salvation? Revelation 13 verse 8 reads, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And 1 Peter 1 beginning at verse 18, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. The phrase everlasting gospel in Revelation 14 verse 6 speaks of the past, the present and the future. When God created humans with the capacity to make moral choices, he anticipated that they would make errant choices. Once his creatures had the capacity to choose, they had the capacity to rebel against his loving nature. The only way to avoid this reality would be to create robot beings controlled and manipulated by some divine cosmic plan. Forced allegiance is contrary to God's very nature. Love requires choice, and once beings are given the power of choice, the possibility of making the wrong choices exists. Therefore, the plan of salvation was conceived in the mind of God before our first parents' rebellion in Eden. As we read in the Desire of Ages, page 22, the plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which hath been kept in silence through times eternal. Romans 16.25 from the Revised Version. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. And that's the end of that quote from The Desire of Ages, page 22. The eternal gospel speaks not only of the past and present, but it also is the basis of a future with hope. It speaks of living eternally with the one whose heart is aching to be with us forever. And so to finish today... Read Ephesians 1 verse 4. Think about what it means that even before the foundation of the world, you had been chosen in Christ to have salvation in him. Why should you think this truth so encouraging? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Wednesday, April 12, Into All the World Read Revelation 14, verse 6 again. What is the extent of the proclamation of the everlasting gospel, and why is the answer important to us and our mission and calling as a church? Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. According to the urgent end-time message of the first of these three angels, the everlasting gospel is to be proclaimed to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Here is a mission so grand, so large, so great, and so comprehensive that it is all-consuming. It demands our best efforts and requires our total commitment. It leads us from a preoccupation with our own self-interest to a passion for Christ's service. It inspires us with something larger than ourselves and leads us out of the narrow confines of our own minds to a grander vision. Read Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. How do these verses dovetail with the first angel's message? Matthew 28 beginning at verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In his book, A Quest for More, Living for Something Bigger Than You, Paul David Tripp discusses the psychological need of every human being to be part of something larger than themselves. He writes, Human beings were created to be part of something bigger than their own lives. Sin causes us to shrink our lives down to the size of our lives. The grace of Christ is given to rescue us from the claustrophobic confines of our own little self-focused kingdom and frees us to live for the eternal purposes and satisfying delights of the kingdom of God. And that's published by B&B Media Group, Living for Something Bigger Than Yourself. There is nothing more inspiring, more fulfilling, more rewarding than being part of a divine movement, providentially raised up by God to accomplish a task far bigger, far larger than any one human being could ever accomplish on their own. The commission given by God, described in Revelation 14, is the greatest task ever committed to His Church. It is an earnest appeal to give our lives to heaven's grandest task to reveal God's incomprehensible love just before Jesus' return. And so to finish the day, what has been your own experience in being involved in something bigger than yourself? How does that experience help you understand the point of this day's study? Also, what could be bigger than being used by the creator of the cosmos to make an eternal difference in the universe. Thursday, April 13, A Mission Movement Through a perceptive, deep study of the Bible, the early Adventists had a growing understanding of the significance of these messages. They sensed that God had a message tailor-made for this generation, an urgent end-time message that must be proclaimed to every nation, tribe, tongue and people in order to prepare the world for Christ's return. The messages of the three angels have been the motivation for Adventist missions since its beginnings. In 1874, the General Conference sent out our first missionary to Europe. Ellen G. White called John Andrews the ablest man in our ranks. Andrews spoke at least seven languages, could repeat the New Testament from memory, and knew most of the Old Testament. He was a brilliant scholar, a prolific writer, a powerful preacher, and a competent theologian. Why send a man like that to a place where there were very few believers? Why send the ablest man you had to an unknown mission field. And why was he willing to go? His wife had died a few years earlier. Why would he be willing to leave family and friends behind in America and sail with his two children to an unknown land, risking all for the cause of Christ? There is only one reason. He believed that Jesus was coming soon and that the message of end-time truth must go to the entire world. Throughout our history, our brightest and our best have travelled to the ends of the earth to proclaim God's last day message. They were teachers, medical personnel, pastors, farmers, mechanics, carpenters and tradesmen of all types. Some were denominational employees, but many were not. They were lay people who believed Jesus was coming soon. Read Revelation 14, 6, Acts 1, 8 and Matthew 24, verse 14. What similarity do you see in these verses? Revelation 14, verse 6 again reads, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And Acts 1 verse 8 reads, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, 
and to the end of the earth. And Matthew 24, verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The preaching of the everlasting gospel leaps across geographical boundaries. It penetrates earth's remotest areas. It reaches people of every language and culture. Eventually, it will impact the entire world. How fascinating to know that our message has so far reached more than 210 of the world's 235 countries recognised by the United Nations. And so to finish the day, what role could you play and how could you better play it in helping spread the three angels' messages to every nation, kindred, tongue and people? Friday, April 14. Dwell more on the idea of Wednesday's study about our need to be part of something bigger than ourselves and our meagre, short-lived, often corrupt, damaged and disappointing lives. Who doesn't have some of those things in their existence? This desire makes so much sense too. Physically, what are we but small buckets of flesh carrying around our own brains, a couple of pounds of carbon-based organic material closer in composition to a bucket of fried chicken than to a hard drive? What can these small self-contained packets of meat mean in contrast to the infinity that surrounds them? To live only for yourself is to live for something no bigger than yourself, when there's so much all around us and beyond us is like being locked for life in solitary confinement amid a large city that you can feel vibrating through the walls. And what larger, grander and more glorious and consequential thing could we live for than proclaiming the message of eternal life that we have been given in Jesus? Ellen White writes in The Great Controversy, page 612, Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men, as it says in Revelation 13.13. 13. Thus, the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity, Ellen White wrote in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald on April 1, 1890. What relationship does justification by faith have to the three angels' messages? Two, dwell more on the phrase everlasting gospel. What is everlasting about the gospel? And three, what does it mean that Seventh-day Adventists are in so many countries of the world? What does it say about how God, so far, has blessed our efforts? At the same time, how can your local church, even your local Sabbath school, play a larger role in finishing the work? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Pink Hair and Gone by Andrew McChesney Days before the start of the school year, a mother called the principal of a Seventh-day Adventist elementary school for help in Ukraine. I don't understand anything about religion and I don't know anything about religious denominations, the mother said. I just saw the sign outside your school reading Christian School and I'm absolutely certain that this is what I have been looking for. The principal was intrigued by the call and asked for more information. She learned that the caller was the mother of a little girl named Natasha. The mother said that when she had been pregnant with Natasha, she had often thought about sending her child to a church school one day. 
The persistent idea puzzled her because she was an atheist. When Natasha reached school age, the mother enrolled her in a private school that promised to nurture creativity in an atmosphere of complete freedom and no discipline. Natasha's mother became alarmed when the girl announced in the second grade that she wanted to dye her hair pink. That summer, she worried that the lack of discipline might hurt her daughter's future. And then she saw the sign for the Adventist school, remembered her thoughts when she was pregnant and thought, I want my child to go to this school. On the first day of school, Natasha started third grade in a class with five other children, all from Adventist families. She struggled at first to catch up with the other children, but she quickly gained ground. Reading the Bible and participating in morning devotions were new experiences for her. Wide-eyed, she eagerly absorbed everything she learned about God. Several weeks into the school year, her mother called the principal to say she was delighted with the changes that had come over her daughter. She loves your Bible lessons and she has fallen in love with the school, she said. She tells us everything that goes on there and has us to pray before meals. I am so happy I brought her to your school. Not long ago, the mother contacted the principal to ask for information about Adventist beliefs. Natasha wants to become an Adventist and I would like to know what changes need to be made in our lives, she said. I also want to become an Adventist. The family story has not ended. Their path with God is just beginning, said Ivan Rapalov, education director of the Euro-Asian division, whose territory includes Ukraine. Thank you for your mission offerings that support Adventist education around the world. Greetings, Sabbath school friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as eyes for the visually impaired through Christian services for the blind in Australia and New Zealand, it became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, remember, God is always faithful.